now? Thank you. Okay, good morning. Thank you again for being here. Um, you can see I'm a two plus tour, so I'm going to be speaking uh, without my mask today. Um, listen, how many of you are arrogant? Ra raise your hand if you're arrogant. It's a loaded question, isn't it? If you know me at all, you know that I'm arrogant. And I wanna talk a little bit more about humility. I find it fascinating that a lot of Bob's sermon today focuses in on the humility of Christ. I tried to focus in last couple of weeks with a thief on the cross going from arrogance just absolutely berating Jesus to that turn. What was that turn with a thief on the cross to where the point where he was humbled? And then with Jesus, we talk about Jesus describing himself in two terms. The only place in the Bible where he talks about himself with the adjectives, I'm gentle, and I'm humble of heart. What does this humble of heart mean? Now, I'm going to give you another assignment if you choose to take it. You know, one of the things that I've been really trying to get you guys all to do is read at least one of the Gospels. And I hope that I, I've, I've sort of prodded you to do that. Read one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Read the story of Jesus. That's a one of the things that we talk about in our faith, read the story of Jesus, but in particular with what I'm gonna talk about today. But one of your assignments, if you choose to take it, I have told you I am a come out of the closet Hallmark person now. I watch Hallmark movies, oh my gosh, never, you know, even two years ago, I would have never thought that I would be a Hallmark person and I just, love to hate them or love them, that relationship, but there is one that if you choose, it's called Finding Normal. I would encourage you to watch a Hallmark movie called Finding Normal because it is that true story. And yes, within the first 10 minutes, it's so darn predictable. You know who the hero, the heroine, and what's gonna happen probably in the end but it's a wonderful Christian movie. And not all Hallmark movies are. It's a wonderful Christian movie about this very arrogant doctor being humbled in a small Southern town. And my guess is, even if you don't like Hallmark, if you choose to watch it, you'll watch it more than once. You either do, tell me what you think about it, okay? All right, I have a question for you, the very first thing, and I expect answers. There it is. Do you see it? What is the foundation of your faith? If someone were to ask you, what's the foundation of your faith? I am saying what? Please do not change my question. <laughs> but I understand, Jan, what you're saying, okay? I, I, I do. What's the foundation of your faith? What would you say? I'm still listening. Anything else? Okay. I heard something back here, and I don't know what it was. Who, who said something? Oh, Pastor Bob. Here we go. He's got, we got the right answer now. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Personal encounter. Okay. 
So let's, let's move on, okay? Can you be clear to others why you believe what you believe? Can you give a clear statement if someone says, why do you believe that stuff? Do you have an answer for people? It's a legitimate question. If someone looks at you and says, why do you believe all that stuff? Do you have a clear answer for them? And then keep going. Is your belief, whatever that that is, you go, well, wait a minute, we all believe the same thing. I just asked what the foundation of your faith was, six or seven different answers, okay? So, is your belief based on feelings, fact, or faith? Is your belief, let me add to that, in Christ, based on your feelings, your facts, or your faith? And someone said, yes, on all the above. Which would be the most important to you, your feelings, your, the facts, or your faith? How many of you would say feelings is the most important part of your belief? How many would say the facts? How many of you would say your faith? <laughs> you just don't want to be hemmed in, do you? Okay, I understand. Let's keep going. Another wonderful question. What separates Christianity from the other faiths? What separates Christianity from the other faiths? You go, well, what other faiths? Well, we you know, can go right on down through it. The Jewish faith, Islam, Buddhism, Confucianism. I mean, we can just run down through it. What separates Christianity from all these other faiths? Because Christianity is not the largest faith in the world. Believing in Christ. Believing in Christ? A risen Christ? Say it again. Based on relationships or faith? Based on, based on relationships. Because? There are people, maybe even here, and I, I'm not going to argue nor negate this today, that say there's not that much difference. They all lead to a path that leads to God, eternity. That's what they're all trying to do anyway. Remember, at the end of class last week, I read you the passage that comes from Ecclesiastes 3, right after there's a time there is a time, there is a time, and right after that it says, eternity has been planted in our hearts. And it doesn't matter, Christian or non-Christian, eternity has been planted in our hearts. So what separates Christianity from other faiths? So the difference is what God has done as opposed to what humans, man, have done. Did anybody, did any of those other faiths die for us? Okay. I'm just listening at this point. Okay. Let's keep going. What separates you from a non-Christian? Because I'm here to tell you, I've had people that will say, you know, Gary, 
You're no different than I am. In fact, without saying it, they're looking at me like, I'm a better person than you are, and they are right. They are right. They are a better person than I am. Their humility by far outshines mine. The deeds that they do outshine whatever that I can think of doing. But there is a separator there. What is that separator? What separates you from a non-Christian? In other words, can somebody pick you out in a crowd saying, Christian, Christian, Oh, nope, no way, no way. Christian, Christian, can that happen? These are all tough questions. But there's a point to where I'm going here, okay? Let's keep going. What do you think about this state? In reality, Christianity makes absolutely, and I want to add that word absolutely in no sense. In reality, in this world reality that we have here, Christianity makes no sense. And I can just name off thing after thing after thing after thing that makes no sense whatsoever in Christianity. It just doesn't make common sense sense. So how is a non-Christian supposed to believe when it doesn't make sense? Not only what it teaches, but the lingo that we have as Christian people just does not make sense to be a Christian. Why? You want an answer why it makes no sense? Because it puts others as more important than yourself. It makes no sense to put others as it is not natural for most people to put others as more important than themselves. In fact, it is one of the toughest it is one of the toughest things for a Christian to do, is to put others before themselves. To humble yourself is one of the toughest things in the world. It just doesn't make sense. I know you're chewing on that. And many of you want to refute me, but you take a good long look at what I just said. We are about us. We are about us. Let me rephrase that statement. I, most of the time, am about me. Right at the beginning of the year, when we first started back, I said, please, 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 Take a good, long, honest look at yourself. When you see yourself in the mirror, start taking a good, long look at yourself. Who are you, really? Don't lie to yourself. Don't justify yourself. But in the end, I satisfy me most of the time. Amen. 
And David was reading off the Beatitudes. Blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. Makes no sense to the world. Doesn't make sense to a lot of Christians. Let's keep going, okay? Here's where we are today. No one, no one expected Jesus to rise from the dead. Not even, go to, please go, not even his closest followers. And, you know, as hindsight people, everyone's really good at hindsight. I'm great at hindsight. You know, I'd like to put myself there and say, oh, if it had been me, I would, I would have expected Jesus to have risen from the dead. <laughs> no, no, and no. I wouldn't have listened and taken it to heart what Jesus was trying to tell them time after time after time after time that he was going to rise from the dead. And the thing is, his crucifixion, coming to that, happened very, very quickly. From the time he entered on that donkey, this is Palm Sunday, to the time he was crucified was just a short window of time. There are just so many events crammed in there where he goes to the garden and prays. By the way, if you read nothing else out of the gospel, well, I shouldn't say that. One of the things I'd like you to read out of the Gospels is his wonderful prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows what is about to happen to him. And two things really hit me in that prayer. Number one, he's still praying for everybody else. I don't know. People will say, well, it was a moment, moment of weakness for Jesus. He was being tempted. I, I don't know what to tell you. I'll let somebody else tell you. But when he says, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And if you understand about the original sin, and if you understand about the original creation, I can just imagine that all of creation, not just heaven, but all of creation going, <gasps> because at that point, at that point, was one of the biggest deciders in the history of the universe right there. Because if he doesn't go through the resurrection, has this cup passed from him, he doesn't go through with the resurrection. Let me tell you, there's nothing. It is gone. It's over. But he humbled himself. And then, when he is confronted, again, read it from John, when he is confronted in the garden and Judas comes up and kisses him on the cheek and he is asked, are you Jesus? Are you Jesus? And he responds with two words. He goes, I am. Notice what's written there. Most people miss this. Everyone there went right to the ground because by saying, I am, he was declaring himself God. Even the toughest of the Roman soldiers, it was John wrote, went right to the ground. It was as if Jesus was saying, just so you know, yet he chose humility. And then remember when he was brought before Pontius Pilate and Pontius Pilate in his arrogance said, don't you understand I have the power to release you? Do you know what Jesus told him? Absolute wonderful statement. 
no pilot, and I'm putting words, you know, I'm paraphrasing it, no pilot, you don't understand. You're the one that doesn't understand. And so all of this he did willingly. And I'd like you to see the very biggest of picture because the resurrection to me, when I ask that question, what's the foundation of my faith? It's that resurrection. Because without the resurrection, there's nothing. Without the resurrection, there's And that's where we are today. Dodie, would you keep going? Jesus was dead. <clears throat> keep going. The three-year movement was dead. Keep going. And it was time to move on. He had come in on the donkey, been crucified on the cross, died in a very short period of time because crucifixions could last two or three days. Died in a very short period of time. He was dead. The movement was dead. The people were scattered. The Sanhedrin thought they had won because it was all about winning at that point. It was time to move on. Let's keep going. And here it is. So now what happens? But on the first day of the week at early dawn, the women went to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared to finish anointing the body. And you go, well, what, why would they be bringing spices to the body? Well, when he was taken down from the cross, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, I'm assuming, went to Pontius Pilate and bought his body. Otherwise, his body would have been dumped with, in an open grave with all the rest of the people that they had crucified over the period of time. And because of when he was crucified, there wasn't time to prepare the body properly. Why? Because it was the Sabbath coming up. There wasn't time. And so they hastily got him in the tomb, put him in the grave clothes, and, you know, poured some spices over him, but that was about it. There just wasn't time. Things had happened too fast. So now, after the Sabbath, the women, which I find fascinating, are going to finish anointing his body to do it properly. And they found the large circular stone rolled back from the tomb. But when they went inside, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed and wondering about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothing stood near them. Let's keep going. And as the women were terrified and were bowing their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why are you looking for the living one among the dead? He's not here, but has risen. So they got told. He's risen. Remember how he told you why he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinful men and to be crucified and on the third day rise from death to life. They got told again. Here it is. Let's keep going. And they remembered his words. And after returning from the tomb, they reported all these things to the 11 apostles and to all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna, the wife of a whatever, and Mary, the mother of James. Also, the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. So what do you think happened when they told this to the apostles? Right, I heard that back there. Right. In fact, in, in the Jewish society of the day, Women weren't even considered reliable witnesses. Truly, women weren't allowed in the courts to testify. They weren't considered reliable witnesses. And I'm sure they're coming back, oh, yeah, we found Jesus. They're going, ah, you know what happened? And the men were going, yeah, right. Okay. 
okay? Let's keep going. But the report seemed to them like idle talk and nonsense, and they would not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping at the, at the small entrance and looking in. He saw only the linen wrappings, and he went away, wondering about what would happen. Let's keep going. They didn't believe. And just, and, and if you think that the women believed, I'll do scripture from another gospel because that report is the women coming back and saying, they've taken his body. Do you know where his body is gone? They didn't believe either. No. It's that resurrection. It was that resurrection. which is the foundation of our faith. Because I clearly asked what, not whom. What? Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw the stone already removed from the groove across the entrance of the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple John, whom Jesus loved, esteemed, and said to them, they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. She didn't believe either. Even after those two angels appeared to the women and told them that he was risen, they didn't believe. Where have they taken him? We don't know. And it's interesting. If you remember the events that unfolded when the men rushed to the tomb to see what was going on. Peter, James, and John. It's always Peter, James, and John, isn't it? The big three. And the disciple whom Jesus loved got there first. Must have been the fastest runner. That's John. Stopped dead in his tracks. Peter, the impetuous, impetuous one, went right on in. But eventually John went in also, and they noticed the same thing. The grave clothes, the strips of linen, were in a neat pile. And they didn't know what to do with that. Because how does somebody... Stand up, take their stuff off that's been wrapped around them, and put them in a neat pile. I understand, at least in my mind, why John stopped. He saw the wrappings, and he's going, wonder what happened here. Peter just didn't care. He wanted to, he wanted to go inside. But... Jesus was supposed to be dead. Now, what's going on? Jesus is supposed to be dead. Let's keep going, Dodie, I know. Yeah. And I've already talked about this a little bit. The traditional burial, if they would have had time, would have been far different than the hasty burial of Jesus. Keep going. It's interesting, isn't it? Why the women, the first to the tomb? How come the men didn't go there? Interesting. Let's keep going. Yeah. And again, we think that if we would have been them, we would have believed. Oh, yeah, I remember Jesus said, I don't think so. In fact, I think less because of how skeptical we have become of everything. Everything. We wouldn't have believed at all. Jesus was dead. He was supposed to stay dead. That's what dead people did. They stayed dead. 
And you might say, well, they saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. They knew about the fact that they brought the little girl back from the dead, or the centurion. This is different. They saw him die. They saw Jesus die. Taken down from the cross when they put that spear in his side and separation, water and the blood flowed out. That's a clear sign of death. You want to read a fascinating um, book about resurrection, The Case for the Resurrection by Lee Strobel. It's absolutely wonderful for you fact people. Case for the Resurrection, Lee Strobel. Let's keep going. And you would have been no different. At least I know I would not have been different. Keep going. I want to hammer this home. Why is the resurrection so important? And we can go through the fact that Christ died for us, our sins. But I'm telling you to expand your horizon just a little bit. He died for all creation, for everything, to put it back into order. That event on the cross is more than just you and me. Let's keep going. It's a foundation of our faith. Because I'll tell anybody, for me personally, this one event is the foundation of my faith in Christ. The resurrection of Christ and the witnesses to it that wrote about it, all these things, it is the foundation of my faith. Jesus is the person but the resurrection is the event. Because without it, there is no Christianity. Jesus was just a good person who did wonderful things. Without the resurrection, Jesus is just a good person who did wonderful things and then died like everybody else. Let's keep going. And. It will not make sense to others unless it makes sense to us. Can you clearly tell another person what the foundation of your faith is? And when people say, why do you believe? I see you're different. What is, what, what is all this about? Can you give a clear story of why you believe what you believe? Thank you. I, I'd like to leave us, um, when I can, with a wonderful song. Okay?